Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Television. It's a program that is designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. And we're doing that. It's very, very exciting. And so we put together some studies here. Corey, what have you put together today? Today we're going to be taking a look at something called the documentary hypothesis. Now this is an alternate theory to how the first five books of the Bible were written. So we're going to be debating that today. So this is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. The five books, some people call them the books of Moses. But That's did right. Moses write them? We'll find out coming up later. Also, Ryan, what is going on? Well, our bones are full of holes, but not to, not to fear. It's no bone eating disease. No bone eating disease. That's Very right. interesting. Well, we've studied a lot on this program. And on today's program, I'm going to bring you this. It must be real. Offerings given to God must really affect you. They, they've got to be part of your life. And we'll talk about that and more as we begin to study and hone in on the Word of God, which is why we're here. Get your Bible guide out, get your Bible out, and let us study. going to be taking a look at the documentary hypothesis. Now this is an alternate theory to the traditional theory that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So in order to evaluate and have intelligent discussion, we first have to figure out what it is. In the late 1800s, a theory took form about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. In its final organization, it rejected Moses as author of the Pentateuch, or Torah, and claimed it was actually written during the time period of the kings of Israel, hundreds of years later, by multiple authors. This theory disregards the claim of the books themselves, Jewish tradition, and all other books of the Bible who name Moses as author-compiler. The theory has come to be called the Documentary Hypothesis, and the claimed reasons for it are literary variations in the text, different names of God being used, different styles of writing, repetition of histories, and irregular place and people group names. However, it can also be argued that this theory was influenced by and accepted readily because of the new and popular theory of evolution that had begun to take over historic studies. The documentary hypothesis gives us not a created text by Moses using existent historic records, but a slow evolution of a religion and society who wanted to establish itself. The documentary hypothesis paints a picture of a lying Israel, one who would falsify history and fabricate divine experiences in order to establish a religious national identity to control and unify its people. If accepted today, it is an unnecessary rejection of a document for the sake of personal historic preference. The beginning of the documentary hypothesis can be traced innocently to the early 1700s when priests and scholars noticed peculiarities that they believed revealed underlying documents used by Moses to compile Genesis. The history that Genesis records, Moses did not live through. So the idea was that Moses compiled Genesis from already existing histories and family records. That concept then snowballed over the next two centuries and was taken to its absurd extremities. Now Moses is rejected, the scriptures ignored, and the documentary hypothesis is taught as fact. Now that we know what the documentary hypothesis actually is, a little bit later on in the program, we're going to be going through uh, some of the harder points on why or uh, why not this is or is not acceptable. We're going to be doing a little bit of a debate, a little bit of a skeptics versus traditional view. Now, I, for one, really do not believe that the documentary hypothesis is necessary uh, to believe at all. A, a traditional view of how the first five books of the Bible uh, were written actually works. 
So in order to come up with uh, a way to discredit the Bible, people came up with the documentary hypothesis. It's very uncomfortable for us to believe that the Bible was written the way the Bible says it was written, which is by faithful men who were inspired by God. And God used uh, their personalities. He used their styles of writing, but they were inspired authors. Uh, and, and even if you take away the inspiration, just from a historian's perspective, if you take away the theology, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is it possible? Is it probable? Is it likely that Moses would have wanted to have written the first five books of the Bible, been able to have written the first five books of the Bible in terms of his education, his language skills, the resources that he would have had, and would he have had the time, the, the means, the motive, and the opportunity? And the answers to those questions are all a resounding yes. So making up an alternate theory here just isn't necessary. The book is called Leviticus, meaning about the Levites and focuses on the work of the priestly clan of Israel. Now we have to look closely at this because God speaks to us through this book. Now the third book of Moses is God's guidebook for his newly redeemed people who are working their way towards becoming a nation. How are they to serve God? How are they to serve each other? How are they to heal and handle diseases? What will be the offerings and how will they be performed? Well, all of these questions are answered in detail in the book of Leviticus. One of the predominant features of this book is that it shows the amazing holiness of the Lord God. In fact, God actually says to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. According to chapter 19, verse 2. Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. The sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. This is important. This is an amazing book. It is the third book of Moses in the Bible. And as we've placed these books and as we see these books, I need to remind you that we have a Bible guide that can take you through them. Now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the 
first five books of Moses, and it's very exciting. If you would like the Bible guide, which I write specifically for this teaching and for this program, then write to us or go to the website and give an offering in any amount, and we will be happy to send you the Bible guide. Very important that you do that. And so as we go through the Bible, we've got 12 of these guides, one for every month, and it's very exciting. Now, here we go. The third book of Moses. This is pertaining to the Levites. I'm very excited about this, so let's take a look. Our Steps of Faith tells us something interesting. It says, be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. Who said that? Well, God said that as he writes this book through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we read, we read Leviticus chapter 1 through 7 today, and we're looking at Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And as we focus on this, we learn much about God, about what he says, and about what he applies to the people who are the Levites and the people of Israel. So in Leviticus chapter 1, as we begin the third book of Moses, we see, now the Lord called to Moses. And the Lord spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. Now that is something else. Now we look at this and we realize that this really means something to the people. The offerings given to God are to be from their livestock. Listen closely. Our offerings must be part of our normal daily life. That's interesting, isn't it? Because some people say, well, I don't give offerings anymore because, you know, offerings, that's, we're in the New Testament now. Well, read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, read there's about 10 assignments I could give you that Paul talks about, to whom much is given, much is required. He quotes Jesus Christ. And it tells us that we are to give. And we're to give on a regular basis. When we come to know Jesus Christ, when we come to know the Lord, we are saved from all kinds of problems and we are given eternal life. Now, if you don't think that you're given eternal life or if you don't think that's important, you think your life now is so important, then you need to understand that, you know, I, I realize that offerings won't be important to you. But if you realize the importance of salvation, if you understand that God saved us, then offerings will be nothing compared to what you think. And we need to be ready to give of the livestock or to give of the offerings that were paid on a regular basis. That's important. Now, that doesn't mean that we give daily, but it means that we set aside our income so that we make sure tithes and offerings are there. We go on in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3. It says, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. He's supposed to offer it before the Lord. Verse 4, then he shall put in his hand on the, or he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priest. And Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle meeting. Now this is fascinating. The offering must be killed. And the hand of the one giving the offering is placed on his head. Beloved, we must feel the offering. It must not be casual. So many times in the West, we are a wealthy country. Even in our poorest state, we are wealthy. I mean, you talk about it, and, and I want to tell you something, that the world is a very different place. I mean, you go into some of these places uh, in, in other countries, and you realize that we are wealthy. And we need to understand that offerings need not be the loose change in our pocket that just throw out. That, that can be an offering, but it needs to be part of something that is you. In fact, the tithe should be 10% of your gross offering. That's what it should be. And actually, the offerings are special gifts to other people. 
And when we understand that, we give with a free will heart, then God realizes, we, we make God to understand, we realize He has given us salvation. That is very important. Now, in verse 6, it says that he shall, he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron and the priests shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. And then the priest, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn on all of it and on the altar. And the, as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. This brings us to the last point. The offering must be totally consumed. Now listen carefully. <laughs> we must give the offering or the tithes with no strings attached. I want you to think about that. We must give the offering with no strings attached. It belongs to the Lord, beloved. And so when we give the offering, we don't give the offering to make sure they spend it. on what I want it spent, for. that's not an offering. We give the offering to the Lord. Now we have to be careful that we give it to the right place, but we give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, you and I have been speaking about something called the documentary hypothesis. It's an alternate theory to explain how the first five books of the Bible were written and it rejects the traditional authorship of Moses. So let's take a look at, a little bit closer at this. The documentary hypothesis is a theory that rejects that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, replacing him with several authors from hundreds of years later during the time period of the kings of Israel. It says the reasons behind compiling the Torah were to give Israel a religious social identity through fabricating history. This theory claims to explain literary variations in the text, using different names of God, names of places and people appearing in their more modern form, repetition of accounts, and writing style differences. Another way to view the text is the traditional view. Starting with the claim of the text that it was authored by Moses, we can account for all of the textual variances, as well as putting the history of the books up against what archaeology has revealed about the Torah's contemporary cultures. This way, we can see if the Torah better reflects the time period of the early patriarchs, or, like the documentary hypothesis claims, if it reflects the time period of the kings of Israel. In the traditional view, it's not necessary that Moses wrote Genesis from scratch. In fact, there is evidence that Moses used already existing documents to compile the history. Neither does it mean that the text was exempt from later editing by scribes. According to ancient practice, place names and people names would have been later updated by scribes, just as modern books will be updated in reprints as our language changes. However, it must be noted that some of the people groups used by the documentary hypothesis as historic errors have actually been proven sound through archaeology. The Hittite people have been verified. The Philistines, or a group later known as the Philistines, have been demonstrated to have lived when the Bible says. Most intriguing has been the discovery of complex law codes, formats, religious documentation, political histories, technological advancements, and early references to Israel. The Torah better reflects the more ancient time period that it claims it is from. Quick Study Television has teamed up with Creation Ministries International to bring to you four DVDs that will deepen your understanding of Christianity's foundations. Genesis and the Gospel Connection demonstrates Genesis' direct link to Jesus and explores creation as it affects the Christian faith. Genesis, the missing piece of the puzzle, explores modern issues that have stunted the growth of Christianity in modern times. Codes in Creation presents a surprising case in the creation-evolution debate, casting clear doubt on modern scientific conventions. 
What the Bible and science say about the age of the earth tackles the question of the earth's age, challenging both secular and Christian positions. We are pleased to offer these DVDs individually for a donation of $15 or more per DVD, or order the bundle of all four for a donation of $45 or more. Write or call and ask for yours today. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television Weekend Edition. It is great to have you as we go through the Bible in one year. And you know, one of the things that I'm going to teach next time is this. We're going to be talking about God commanding the priest to be brought to him. God actually says that. He says, I command the priest to be brought to me. It's interesting because the priests don't bring themselves to God. Mm -hmm. He commands Moses to bring them. It's very interesting. Anyway, we'll talk about that next time on the Quick Study Television program. Right now, Ryan is here with Science Rocks. Well, today we're talking about bones. Now, did you know that our bones are full of holes? It's true. And while at first glance this might seem to be a bad thing, it's actually extremely beneficial. Let's study. Our bones are full of holes, just like a sponge. However, this is no bone-eating disease, but rather it is the engineering of a master architect. And while it might seem like a poor design choice to create sponge-like skeletons, it is this design which provides ultimate support. Indeed, Answers Magazine reports that spongy or cancellous bone may look soft with all those holes, but there's nothing squishy about it. A closer look shows that its fibers are precisely placed to bear stress, like girders on a skyscraper. In fact, throughout your life, the bone is constantly dismantling and rebuilding those fibers, called trabeculi, from Latin for small beam, to maintain the best configuration for changing loads, such as the shifting stress caused by pregnancy. This marvelous design provides maximum strength at minimum weight. In fact, in the 1850s, anatomist Hermann von Meyer studied trabeculi within the human femur. And later, Swiss engineer Karl Kuhlmann even generated a mathematical model of the femur design. Then in 1889, French engineer Gustave Eiffel, using Kuhlmann's mathematical model, designed and erected the now famous Eiffel Tower, with a base that duplicated the upper end of our femur bones. The Eiffel Tower, which was originally built only as a temporary structure for the World's Fair in 1889, was criticized for its design by competing architects who predicted it would soon fall under its own weight. Yet even with a height of 1,063 feet, the Eiffel Tower still stands strong today as a testimony to God's original brilliant design. However, this spongy bone, which is found predominantly inside the ends of the long bones, can do more than just bear heavy loads. The holes also provide space to store marrow, which produces blood cells, and the surfaces of all those trabeculi release a calcium and phosphorus to maintain mineral balance in your body fluids. The almighty master craftsman has thought of every last detail, and it is clear that without his engineering, we would absolutely collapse and cease to function. Indeed, just as a tower requires a designer, so do we require a creator. As we explore creation, it becomes very evident that there has to be a creator, a master architect and engineer who has carefully and wonderfully made all things. In fact, many of our best man-made technologies come from studying the blueprints and designs of creation. It's true. And if you don't believe me, check out this book by Donald D. Young and Derek Hobbs called Discovery of Design. Now, here they document this very thing. For example, the idea for the light stick actually came from the observation of fireflies. And the anti-gravity spacesuit technology actually came from studying the giraffe, believe it or not. You know, creation is absolutely filled with stunning technology from the master designer. Now, if you want this book, you'll need to go through Creation Ministries International. Their website, of course, is creation.com. Creation.com is an excellent website, and I use it a lot and go to it a lot. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but we do their program in here. Yeah, yeah. So the CMI with program yeah. with Richard and with Calvin, mm -hmm. it's really good. And uh, I want to encourage you to uh, check it out, creation.com. 
go there. Don't, you know, don't order the book from us because we're going to, we don't have the book. They have the book. Very important. Hey, I want to tell the people about our dress. Okay. Can right. I do that? Sure. It's important for you to know that you can reach us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Now that's on the internet and the internet is important. Remember TV, Bible Discovery tv.com that tv is very very important also remember this the roku has us on the channel you can watch us on a number of different boxes that put the the searching on their search quick study or search rod hembry whatever you want you'll find us at bible discovery tv.com the roku box is somebody something you can buy uh, in a store like walmart or you know best buy or something like that very important a very good thing you hook it up to your tv set and so on and if you'd like to get a hold of us and get a hold of the bible guide you can write to us at the united states of america quick study p.o box 150 Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Now, in Canada, you can write to us at Quick Study Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. And if you're in another nation somewhere, make sure that you use these numbers or use the Canadian number uh, or the Canadian address to get to us. Also, remember our BibleDiscoveryTV.com logo and uh, place. Very important. Offerings are fascinating gifts because God doesn't need them. However, we must give them if we love the Lord. Many people figure out ways to control their offerings after they give them. But the reality of a true gift of tithe or an offering is that we must let it go once it's given. God must take control. Our offerings are given to God and we must let them go. It's critical we understand and recognize the meaning and the power of an offering given from a willing heart with right attitudes. You know, it's amazing. At the end of the program, I love to finish this part telling you that Jesus Christ is alive and he is God of the universe. He's God of everything. And he came 2000 years ago and you know what? He died for our sins on the cross and he was tortured and he suffered, but he rose again suddenly on his own. And he did so, so you and I could have eternal life. Come to Jesus today, pray to him and say, Lord Jesus, be my savior now.